a lot of these fights are symbolic. Lunch counters, water fountains, those weren't the most pressing problems facing the civil rights movement, but, but they can be powerful symbols when you're trying, mm -hmm. to, trying to change the way people view a certain minority mm -hmm. and trying to assert the rights. Uh, so I think, I think it's important to look at it both. both and we, we run into this problem all the time. I mean, in, in the Freedom From Religion Foundation, what we do, you know, we're fighting symbols constantly. Ten Commandments on public land, yeah. crosses on public land, and th those are important fights to have uh, for that very reason. So I, I think it's not necessarily just about the bathroom, and it's not necessarily about a non-issue. Kind of in the way that it's not necessarily about um, baking a cake or you know getting give, giving flowers to a gay wedding in that that arena, mm -hmm. um, which I think you and I disagree on that. Yeah. All right. Let, let, let's go there. So my pal, I feel that if this person has a religious belief and they don't want to bake a gay wedding cake, <laughs> we now live in a time where either you can get a cake at another baker, perhaps in your town or one town over, but people said to me, well, what if you don't uh, live in, there's no bakers near you anywhere. We also live in a time where Amazon can pretty much deliver you anything anywhere. And I just don't like the federal government coming in and demanding that they do something that's against their belief. That, that's just my, my belief. That's well, what a about, little what more about libertarian. Like the, what about like the state governments doing it? So for in the Oregon case, it's all, the Oregon Baker case, it's all state government that's, that's happening. So lay that out just so, so we're this on is the same the, page and everyone knows exactly So this is, a, this is a, a gay couple went into a bakery, uh, Sweet Cakes by Melissa, I think yep. the name, and wanted uh, them to bake a cake for their gay wedding. Uh, they said, no, we love Jesus more than you. We're not gonna do it. Uh, and the this, this state, civil rights body actually they made a com the couple made a complaint to the state civil rights body and they said yes um, you know you you have to do this because our law doesn't allow you to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation um, and and that was that's been the case that's making its way up to the Oregon Supreme Court so so I mean you're it's are you kind of more in the a market-based solution type my gut feeling on this is more of a market-based solution so I get what you're saying in this yeah. case it's specifically the state yeah. not not the federal yeah. government so I do make so, that distinction for sure. Unfortunately, I would say, you know, I had Randy Barnett, who's a constitutional law professor at Georgetown, I had him on the show, sure. and he mentioned a phrase that I really love, which is the foot vote. That then if you don't like what your local area, if it's your local town that the sure. baker is bad in, or if you don't like the, the state government of Oregon in this case, you're allowed to move, and that's the beauty of our system. Sure. And I know it kind of sucks, like it doesn't feel right. Believe me, I, you know what I mean? A lot of people, I got people, gay people that were emailing sure. me saying, you know, I, I'm not happy with you on this. It, I know it doesn't feel right, but, but every excuse for just more government control I don't like, and because we live in a time where you can get a cake a jillion other ways, and you can move and take your money and the worth that you bring to your community and all of those things, that's just where I would fall on this. Well, well let, let, me make, let me make the case. And I think, I think there's two things. So for all these, all the kind of the market-based ideas, the market-based solutions to, to these issues, they all are premised on the idea that people, producers and consumers, and I, first of all, I'm not an economist. Let me lay that out right now. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> They're okay. all premised on the idea that producers. We'll put that big under yeah, your name. Please right do. Now. <laughs> not an economist. <laughs> producers and consumers behave logically, and they make decisions, most importantly, logically. And we just know that's not true. Exhibit A is religion, Exhibit B is Trump. People vote against their interests all the time. And Exhibit C is the case itself, right? The baker is turning away perfectly good money, mm -hmm. right? So they're, they're not behaving rationally or logically in yeah. terms of, of economics. Wait, so, let me pause you there for a second, because yeah. I think in a way that also strengthens my argument, which is I think that 99% of people in business are in business to make money, and 99% of people would not let their religious view override their view to be successful. So in other words, if you opened up a coffee shop and said, we're, first, well, first off, not serving people is different than not doing a specific action that they want you to do. Sure. But most people are in business because they want to make money. And I think that we're, we're making such an issue out of a tiny little thing there. So continue. All right, there. well, this side, it dovetails nicely with my second yeah. point. So Great. one of the things <laughs> that, I, that I do at FFRF is I go all around the country and I talk about these kind of issues. And right now there's an attempt to redefine religious liberty. Um, it's it kind of is the biggest example that people might be familiar with is that the Hobby Lobby decision that the mm -hmm. Supreme Court made a couple of years ago. It, it's turning it's weaponizing religious liberty instead of being this this right for you to behave a certain way and to to do a certain thing. It allows you to impose your religion on others. That that's the the change that we're seeing in the law that that we're fighting against. Mm -hmm. And one of the clips that I show when I give this talk is a, a CNN uh, report. They went to a small town in Georgia. Georgia was considering. 
passing a religious freedom law that would have helped with this this redefinition. You may remember it. There was a big backlash against it. Um, the NFL said we're not going to come there. All these companies, yeah. 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 So. Um, I show this this video, and uh, CNN went to uh, a small town. They interviewed florists in that town, and would you serve a gay couple? Absolutely not. And they went. Every single one of the florists in town said that, right? So it, it's so they're a lot of florists gay. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, a whole other issue. But so, how many florists? Like, no, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> well, you can, and actually, one of the guy, one of the florists' son was going into the seminary, and. Uh, I'll, I'll post the video somewhere. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really good. It's worth watching. It's online, or right? yeah, it's, okay, it's online. Okay, so we'll, we'll link to it below on this. Okay, I'll, um, so the, I mean, and now it's not a big deal, right? For if you can't get flowers for your wedding, it's not. It's not the end of the world. But it, but if that's food, or gas, or you know, formula for your baby, then that becomes a real issue. And and maybe it's not being gay. Maybe it's being black, or maybe it's being Jewish, mm -hmm. and. Maybe it's not just this town. Maybe it's the town oh, next over and the town that's next over. And you're right, the times have changed, but if that sounds absurd to people, like they have to remember that that's the whole reason that we have the Civil Rights Act in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, in King's Birmingham, letter from the Birmingham jail, he wrote it in, I think, April of 63. He even talks in there about having to spend his, spend nights in his car on a cross-country road trip in the uncomfortable corners of his car because he couldn't, no hotel would let him stay there. Yeah. And when Kennedy proposed the Civil Rights Act, when he made his speech, I think it was in the Oval Office in June of 63, and one of the first things he says is that everybody has to have equal access to places of public accommodation. It was the whole purpose mm -hmm. of this because we were effectively creating an entire second class of citizens by not allowing them to purchase gas or to, to get a motel room. Uh, and it, it's, it's incredibly problematic. I right. think it's so appropriate it's, for government regulation. Yeah, so it's interesting because look, if there was a gas station that said, we're not giving, we're not serving gas to mm -hmm. black people or Jews or Muslims or whatever else it is, or white people, even though they're not a minority at the moment. But if you know, they were just picking something based on discrimination, just for the service that they offer everybody, sure. I think there's, a, there's an exceptional argument to be made there, okay. absolutely. The case with the cake, I think, is a little bit different because they didn't say we won't sell you a cake. We won't sell you a cake customized to this specific thing that is against our religious belief. And in this case, even though I'm against their religious belief, I just think, even in the case of the florists, so okay, you go, you go to all the florists, and every, I mean, all these florists saying no to a gay wedding cake is kind of hilarious. I feel like somebody needs to do a spoof of that. But then ultimately, it would be on you to order something from 1-800-Flowers or to, to just move. But I, I see what you're saying is perfectly principled. And again, this is where they, I, I'm not going to force my beliefs on you in any way. Like, you know, I, I like that. And you may not know this either. Uh, you, you know, ex-Muslims of North America. Yeah, of course. Haters. Sure. Sure. Hater, yeah. yeah, they actually, uh, they were denied a cake at a bakery in Virginia. And she called me. Yeah. And I wrote a letter to the, the company and actually they got a cake out of it. Wait, quickly. So, but they, so they wanted a cake for a for a Muslim wedding. To celebrate, no, to celebrate oh. being ex-Muslims. Oh, right, 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 like right, right. I did see this. One or two years, uh, there was their anniversary of their organization. Yeah, yeah, and they weren't. They were the. I guess there was a Muslim worker in that bakery. I don't remember the name of the chain. Um, the, the, and whatever the name of the chain was, they did. A, they did a great job. Um, yeah. When I wrote to corporate, they they hopped in the year and said. That shouldn't have happened. We're we're incredibly sorry. Yeah. Here you go. Here's an here's another case. So basically, it was one worker who happened to be Muslim. He saw them celebrating their, you know, anniversary of, of the ex-Muslim organization. Mm -hmm. The company then did the right thing. Correct. You, you either have to suspend or fire this guy. I mean, I'm not. What do you think about these exceptions now that we see private companies doing, where you know, uh, you know, I've seen this several times. Like a Muslim flight attendant doesn't have to serve alcohol or. You know, something of that nature. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that that well for a private company, they can do whatever they want if they if they, if that's the way they want to accommodate yeah. somebody's religion. They're they're. I think it's just to. a terrible accommodation. I, I, I would be that, okay yeah. with not hiring that person if you're a flight attendant and your job, in the job description, serve people what they want that we have on this plane. Yeah. I would be a hundred. That's not discrimination. You're looking at a breadth of what they can do. And I would be for just not hiring that person. The, the scarier version of this is actually happening right now in, in the federal law. So the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, that's what the Hobby Lobby decision was based on. Mm -hmm. and, and that is saying the same kind of thing, except it's saying that your religion allows you to be exempt 
from general and neutrally applicable laws because you're religion. That's it. The Hobby Lobby case was fundamentally about providing birth, birth control. And the Hobby Lobby owners, the owners of that company said, these are abortifacients. They cause abortions. And therefore, they are against our religion. That is 100% wrong. That belief is not accurate. It is scientifically inaccurate. They are not abortifacients. And uh, the Supreme Court got a brief from 60 or 70 medical and scientific organizations saying this belief conflicts with fact. Mm -hmm. okay? And the Supreme Court didn't even address it. They said they believe, they believe that they are abortifacients. Therefore, they get to be exempt from having to provide them. Reality didn't matter. So they what the Supreme Court did was they elevated a counterfactual, completely unsupported belief above the law just because it's labeled as religious, because it's held with unshakable certainty. And that's, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about redefining religious liberty. That is the scary, scary fight that we're seeing right now. It is taking these unsubstantiated beliefs and allowing people to be exempt from the law because of it. And the, the Supreme Court dealt with this issue back in 1878 from a constitutional standpoint. They said that if we do this, if the First Amendment allows you to be exempt from any law you want just because your religion says so, we're gonna have chaos, it's anarchy. You, I mean, everyone would start their own religion. Exactly, government is pointless, don't even, don't even bother. Yeah, there you go, exactly. <laughs> so to have, to have people doing that, it, it's, it's unworkable. Um, but this is all based on a law, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, not the Constitution. So that's actually good news because if we repeal the law, it gets rid of the Hobby Lobby decision. But instead of doing that, what you're seeing now is more laws being proposed. Right now you're seeing the First Amendment Defense Act, which takes RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, a step farther and says that, yeah, even discrimination, which is a little unclear under RIFRA, go for it. You can discriminate in the name of your God. It's not a problem at all. It's 100% okay. So it's, this is a, it's a very scary fight. And it's also, it's also short-sighted. I think this is one thing that never gets talked about that, that's a little frustrating to me. The religious right is so short-sighted in their strategies. Um, and there, there are plenty of great examples of this. Um, the, the, the prayer before government meetings that we were talking about. Yeah. The reason they fought for that is because they were all Christian prayers. But we're start, now the Supreme Court has said that you can't just have Christian prayers. Right. They have to be anybody, including an atheist. Right. We're actually suing Congress so that our co-president can get up there and give a secular invocation before Congress. Right. Uh, and you're seeing the Satanic Temple <laughs> getting up there and giving invocations before town meetings in Florida, and people are going bomb. So that's really the short sightedness because they've been fighting for it when it, was, when it was to the exclusion of everyone else. Exactly. Suddenly, the, the same law, as it gets widened, you're and not you gonna be so thrilled with exactly, it. Exactly, and you see it everywhere. Um, yeah. Another great example is the Equal Access Act allows students to form student clubs in school. And it was passed specifically because the court said kids can't form a religious club in a public school. That's, that's uh, not, not under the Constitution, you can't do that. So they passed the Equal Access Act, which says that if you allow kids to form any club, they also have to be allowed to form a religious club. And now that's being used for every atheist club in the country, every LGBT club in the country is using that law to form. But the, the scarier version of the short-sightedness is when it comes to things like Muslims and Sharia law and things like that. Like it, the exemptions apply to everybody. If if people are wouldn't that be the ultimate irony? It would be. And if people are genuinely worried about that, like this is there's a, there's this big fear, you know, uh, Sharia supremacy, uh, and Frank Gaffney's pushing this idea that you know that Islam is this it's this totalitarian political ideology. It's not a religion. Mm -hmm. uh, so we should we it's okay to treat these treat Muslims not as uh, we would treat other religious people. Mm -hmm. The point of all this though is we already have the solution to all of these issues and it's called the separation it's of state and church. Like, they should be fighting alongside FFRF, not mm -hmm. against FFRF. You know, and that, that is the easiest way to, to not have any of these problems in the future. But Yeah, you know, that's yeah. why I would always err on the side of anything that would strengthen the Constitution, anything that would strengthen the laws that we live by, which is actually a perfect segue to where I wanted to go here, which is, so as a guy that, that believes in law, that is a lawyer, that you've referenced Supreme Court decisions often, you know what you're talking about, all this stuff, how scary is it to you that, this, that the Supreme Court, the way we appoint justices now, even at the state level, that it all is becoming insanely politicized? The whole point of separation of church, of uh, separation of powers, was to keep this stuff 
from being overly politicized. But now it's like they almost everyone in Congress votes on party lines. Uh, we know all kinds of shady stuff goes on behind the scenes, by the way, on both parties through pressure, when Obama wanted to get Obamacare passed, when Trump now wants to get this, uh, this thing passed, that we're politicizing things that are supposed to be apolitical, so most importantly, the Supreme Court. I mean, I think, the, yeah, the entire federal judiciary, well, not just federal, the entire judiciary throughout the, the country is, that it, it's a very scary development. And the, the, the scarier thing is the money that is going into state elections for judges is, is insane. And it's, it's incredibly scary. And, you know, I mean, how are you not beholden to a company that's put two or three million dollars into, you know, getting you elected? How are you not beholden to that, that company when they come up in front of you on a case? And of course, that's the reason they're doing it in the first place. Of course they are. Like, let's, yeah. let's, not, let's not be Wait, they're not just giving about, money away? Yeah, let's not be children. They don't really like money? I mean. <laughs> exactly. I mean, so I think, I think the, the, the politiz politicization, jeez, of judges and the judiciary is, is very scary and very problematic. I mean, I think to a certain extent it's always been there, but it does, it does seem to be worsening right now. And, yeah. it's, and especially at the, the, the lower levels. Um, I mean, the, the federal judiciary, the Republicans are really, really good at holding out as they've demonstrated with Garland and now Gorsuch. They're really good at holding out for what they want. They're, they're better at playing the political game than Democrats are for sure. Um, and they're they're changing the court system and jurisprudence because of it. Um, so that's why they're doing it. They're they're effectively winning. Yeah. Um, but it's also I mean it's almost in a way it's almost scarier at the the state level, especially if you're just an average citizen. That's where that's where the, a lot of those decisions are going to affect you far more than than some of the Supreme Court decisions. Yeah. Is there anything on its way up to the Supreme Court right now that people aren't really thinking about that we should be thinking about? There's two cases there right now. Um, there's one which is, is an amazing case. Um, it's out of Wisconsin, actually, and it's, it's about political gerrymandering. So gerrymandering on t to further the Republican Party. And if the court strikes... Just real quick, for people that don't know what gerrymandering is, I mean, it's basically yep. redrawing the map, the local maps, so that they favor one candidate or, or one party. or Correct. Another. And, yeah. and it's, um, it's been done very effectively by the Republicans in the last couple rounds of elections. They, they redraw the maps every 10 years, I think, based on uh, the, the census. Um, and this is challenging it on, it's been struck down before on, in terms of race. Um, you know, you can't, can't favor um, whites at the expense of African Americans, say, to vote. The idea is every vote should count. You shouldn't have wasted votes. And right now they could strike down, there's a case before them where they could strike down political gerrymandering. Um, the second case is, out of um, Minnesota, uh, it's Trinity Lutheran. And this case actually will, it'll be do serious, serious damage to the separation of state and church. Basically, a church applied for public money. They would have been given a grant, I don't remember how much, doesn't matter how much, we'll just say $10,000, doesn't matter at all, yeah. it could be a dollar. Um, $10,000 um, to, to revamp their playground. And the government said, no, we can't give you money, you're a church. Like, you have to do this on your own. That's, you know, there's a separation of state and church. And they're suing over it. And if that decision goes the wrong way, then that-, that what, what possible grounds are they suing? They're, they're suing on, they're suing on saying, you're giving this money to schools and other secular organizations uh, to allow them to revamp their playgrounds. You're discriminating against us because we're religious. Hmm. Um, which the separation of state and church is discrimination in a way, except it's deliberate, it's right? <laughs> and it's okay because you also get all these benefits from they're, the separation of state They're and tax exempt and they have membership, <coughs> right? I mean, they have people that pay into the church it's, for the church to do what they want with that money and they're tax exempt. They've and got a pretty sweet gig. There's so much more than that too. Not only are they tax exempt, and this is amazing to me, they don't have to submit anything to the IRS. You wanna be a tax exempt church, you just say, I'm a tax exempt church. And then every single year, so for instance, FFRF, we hire an outside audit company to come in and audit our books every year, and we submit this Form 990 to the IRS. It's huge, it's onerous, it takes like a week to complete, and it tracks every penny that goes in and every penny that goes out of the organization. Churches don't have to do any of that. We have no idea what kind of money comes into these places, no idea what kind of money goes out, they're, com they're completely exempt. And they also have crazy other benefits under the law. Um, ministers of the gospel, quote, ministers of the gospel, that's the phrase that our law actually uses, can take money that their church pays them 
as individuals that's designated for housing, and they don't have to pay taxes on that. Right? It's just completely tax exempt. They, as individual employees, get mm -hmm. a complete tax exemption as long as uh, the money's designated as a housing allowance. That's it. Um, so, so there's a hilarious irony, well, it's a depressing irony, I suppose, <laughs> which is so they're not paying taxes, and yet they're also bringing a lawsuit that would say we want tax money yes. to do something, and at the same time, our books are completely closed. So for all you know, we've got five million in the bank. Yes. They want to have their cake and eat it too. And, and this is the other push that you're seeing in the law. And <clears throat> they're actually using a lot of the language of free speech. They don't, want, they don't want any of the burdens that come with state church separation. Yeah. Um, but they want all the benefits. So they want all the benefits of state church separation and then all the benefits of free speech and all these other things. They don't want to take any of the burdens that go along with it. And that, that's another big fight that we're having. But that case is, is genuinely terrifying because if, if, if the Supreme Court says, yes, you have to fund this, that opens the floodgates of tax money going to it, churches. It's never been done. Right, it just, I mean, it's simply on its face, forgetting my feelings about religion or anything like that. It, it just simply makes no sense because they're not paying into the system. I suppose maybe you could make some argument if at the very minimum, they were paying taxes into the system and then they wanted some of that tax money back or something like that, although that si sounds kind of crazy too, but yeah. the other part makes no sense. Uh, is there anything going on related to that right now in the legal system related to getting tax exempt status taken away from these things? Because this is one of the things, that, <coughs> I think, for, for atheists or non-believers or even for some sure. religious people that view, you know, when they see the Mormon church putting money into fighting gay marriage, a political, Thing, so you know, yeah, political the, event. the biggest thing with that right now is something called the Johnson Amendment. And the Johnson Amendment is a very simple rule. It was passed in the 50s. And what it says is that churches cannot engage in partisan politics. They cannot appear to endorse or oppose a specific political candidate. It doesn't prevent them from talking about issues. They can still talk about gay marriage. They can still talk about abortion. They could talk about civil rights if they wanted to. Nobody ever wants to. <laughs> so they're, they're perfectly able to do that. Right, so they can subtly do it. <laughs> Exa well, and, right? no, they can talk about issues. Right. That's, that's fine. What they can't do is just endorse or come out against a, p a political candidate or mm -hmm. you know maybe a specific bill, something like that sometimes. So it's, it's, it's partisan politicking that's prohibited. Yeah, when I say subtle, I mean you can basically tell people what you there was a, to, as to soon as you correct. said it, a, what popped into my head was when uh, Rick Santorum was running. Um, you know, he always used to wear those sweater vests. The, yeah, yeah. He appeared in church next to a pastor, and the pastor was dressed exactly like him with a sweater vest and all that. You know, just what like an odd coincidence. A wink, wink, yeah, yeah, a wink, wink, nudge, nudge kind right. of thing. Um, so the way that that the amendment is structured is it's tied to the tax exemption. So it says if you want to be tax exempt, fine, you're able to. But you can't do this. And it applies to all 501c3s, all nonprofits, and all churches as well. And churches are saying, no, 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 no. That's a burden on our free speech. And you have to let us endorse people. Otherwise, you're violating our free speech. And it's not. They're right. faced with a choice. You can endorse people if you want. You just don't get to be tax exempt. And I think the thing that people don't realize, I mean, the Johnson Amendment, it's so unsexy and so boring. Like, how do I get people interested in this? Yeah. But it's, if, if it is repealed, it is, it's going to be terrifying. If you think Citizens United was a bad decision, this is 10 times worse, 100 times worse. But again, because we don't know what kind of money is coming into churches and what kind of money is going out. They will effectively become completely unregulated, completely dark CPACs. They will be these black holes of financial information and power that people can just funnel money into, gobs, millions. I don't think it's absurd to say billions of dollars will go into them, yeah. and then they can spend it on whatever they want. I mean, so it's not about free speech. When you hear about the Johnson Amendment and repealing it, it is not free speech. It is about money and power, which is something that churches have been off after for millennia. Yeah. Oh. Uh, we could do this for so much more time. So you're <laughs> definitely going to have to come back. But oh, is there, is there anything major that I missed here that would put a nice bow on all this if we're just talking about the state of everything? Yeah, right I, I think so. I think that... You're like, yes. You, yes. There's a lot, actually. People, yeah, we, I, I could do this. <laughs> Has it really been an hour? It's been an hour. Wow, okay, yeah. yeah. So people should join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, yes. first of all. I mean, that, I think that is, if you, if you care about these issues and you care about the separation of state and church, we are a membership organization. You know, and I, I certainly want their membership dues, but more than that, I want their voice. Well, your books are open, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I, and the people can see every Form 990, it's online. But, yeah. but I, I want people's voice to be joined with ours. You know, when I, when I write a letter to that school district on behalf of that mom and say, you know, this teacher needs to stop praying, it's great when I can say we have 1,200 members in Florida, or we have 5,000 or 10,000. We have 27,000 members right now. But the more people that join us, the stronger our voice becomes. 
And I, I again, you know, I just I keep coming back to that the short sightedness of of the religious rights strategy right now. Secularism has worked for this country. It is not a dirty word. We invented the separation of state and church. This is like this is a quintessentially American thing. It's enshrined in our constitution. Everybody should be supporting this. It is it's your patriotic duty. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, yes, so come come join FFRF. Help us in this. I part. thought you heathen atheists don't love country or something. <laughs> you know? the, not how it works. We've been accused of it often. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But not how it works. Yeah, I only stand up and fight for the First Amendment every day. So you know. Did we get some good ideas out here? Because life's too I, short to waste on bad ideas. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I hope so. Yeah. All I right. had a lot of fun. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you. I'm, gl I'm glad we finally got to do this in person, and we'll we're gonna do this again because this stuff's it's just not going anywhere. No, it's not. Yeah. We're, we're gonna be here for a while. All right, very good. Uh, for more on Andrew and his work, check out his website, andrewlsidel.com.